thank you very much for the kind introduction, Jill. Um, I am Amy McDonald, um, Engagement and Learning Officer uh, for the Connecting Scotland Science Project. Um, so my talk today is going to be about some collaborative initiatives which are focused on sounds that have already been recorded and, and that have been archived across Scotland. I think that audio heritage can be a slightly overlooked part of our heritage sometimes, and not least because recording formats and playback technology that, that a lot of us will have seen throughout our lifetimes have chopped and changed a lot, and even before many of us were born, um, there was a lot of chopping and changing then, there too. If anyone would like to see some of those sound formats later, I've got some examples on the stall which I'd be more than happy to, to share with you, it's just at the back. Um, so as you can see from the uh, logos at the bottom, um, we've got lots of uh, pre-digital sound formats, analog sound formats that we think of when we think of recorded sounds. Um, we've got wax cylinders, wire recordings, cassettes, open reels, discs, um, and then we moved on to digital recordings um, and across the world there are a whole host of exciting formats like DAT tapes, mini discs, CDs, um, and now a lot of the uh, recording goes straight to, um, to hard drives. So just to say that um, I'll be mentioning the Scotland Sounds Network first. I'll then be talking a little bit about the project that I work on, Connecting Scotland Sounds, and I'll be mentioning some of the heritage sound recording collections here in the northeast of Scotland. Um, and throughout the presentation, I'll be hopefully playing a few snippets for you as well so you can um, listen in to Scotland's past uh, together. So Scotland Sounds is a network of stakeholders that meet regularly. Um, there are folks working in museums, libraries, archives, community archives and also independent collection holders. Um, they meet regularly um, uh, as part of um, a project coordinated by the National Library um, and there are a huge number of organisations and individuals across Scotland who uh, enjoy coming together and sharing um, knowledge and sharing information about the audio recordings that they have. Um, so they care for all sorts of different sounds. There can be people coming along who've got archive radio broadcasts, music from times gone by, oral history interviews, environmental sounds. We've got the Scottish Ornithologist Club, we've got some fantastic recordings, and um, sound art and more. And um, if you are sitting there thinking, we've got we've got some sounds, we've got some sounds, we should be part of that network, please do get in touch with me. I'd be delighted to add you to our mailing list and welcome you to any of our free events. Um, so just to say that the, the vision of that group of stakeholders, which we're all working together on, um, is that there needs to be more visibility to sound collections, because quite often they are, they are a little bit buried, um, needing some form of technology to, to release them, to let people listen to them, um, and that we also want to be working together to increase the standards of preservation and to try and share them with, with others. So UNESCO and, and the British Library have given the world 15 years to try and digitise all our magnetic tape recordings, so uh, from reel to reel to um, compact cassette, um, the material itself is degrading and we've also got a problem with playback um, equipment becoming obsolete, so there's a real deadline to trying to uh, digitise these recordings in order to save them for generations to come to enjoy. So I've got a little a little tune to play for you and I need to go to that computer, so bear with me. So what you're hearing in terms of that pat, pat, pat is the sound of a, a wax cylinder turning. The recording itself is a James Scott Skinner recording of um, Cradle Song Medley. Um, it's archived by the National Library of Scotland, um, but if you want to listen to some James Scott Skinner recordings online, I'd recommend um, aberdeen.ac.uk forward slash Scott Skinner because they've got about 80 recordings that you can enjoy from your chair at home. So um, 
for early recordings for fiddle tunes, they used a straw fiddle. Um, and again, if you're looking for something to Google later, it's really worth having a look at what that looks like. It's almost more like a Chinese violin with a, with a metal horn to try and amplify the fiddle music. Thank you very much. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> Sorry, it's not stopped. we all trying to do about this material? How are we trying to work together? Well, Connecting Scotland Sounds is one of the outcomes um, from that group of stakeholders. It's a project funded by Esme Fairburn and it looks at the uh, knowledge exchange behind pres preserving those materials and also looking at uh, audience engagement to try and share some of those sounds. So the aims of the project is that we share the sounds, that we engage new audiences, and we try and help increase skills and expertise in sound archiving, including digitization. And we've got quite a, um, a detailed knowledge exchange program that we've got running across uh, different parts of Scotland to help people who look after collections to gain more expertise in particular areas around sound archiving. So some of the topics covered have been um, looking at digitizing sounds, looking after digitised sounds once they're, uh, once you've got your digital copies. Um, we've been looking at analogue preservation, so looking at you know how you store wax cylinders, that kind of thing. Um, and in the new year, we'll be having topics like putting sounds online and uh, looking at copyright behind sounds as well. Um, our latest knowledge exchange event happened at the Duncan Rice Library at the University of Aberdeen um, and I would like to play one of their recordings um, to you just now. So this is a recording uh, from an oral history interview with Dr Stella Henriquez um, who passed away a number of years ago and her recording talks about um, what it was like to be a student when uh, World War I came to an end. In the meanwhile, we had the armistice, I told you. Uh -huh. That was 1918, of course, Monday, 11th of November. And we never had the money for a newspaper, never knew the war was coming to an end. Uh, if you hear of things now, or read of things, they tell you that people were realizing the war was coming to an end, but we didn't understand that. It had been going on so long that we just didn't know. Uh -huh. And so on that Monday morning, when the bell tolled at 11, it just meant to us that that was the end of an hour and that the next class would be starting. Yes. But as we were a chemistry lab thing, we were going on for two hours, so we never moved. Yes. And then somebody burst in and said, the war's over. Good gracious, well, of course, we fled down the stairs and chaos, all work abandoned that day. And men were absolutely dotting, of course, the thought that it was over. And so, how on earth we managed to uh, uh, acquire the garments, but we had a fancy dress marked with the torches that night. Yes. And then, of course, the next day, we were never content, we decided we'd have the day off, and the senator said, no, you'll go back to work. We said, no, we weren't going, and we didn't go, but they had their own way back on us. I know Professor Trey looked at us very soberly, and he said, he said, the war is not over yet, this is only an armistice. But of course, we couldn't understand this, yeah. we were dotted with all of it. Anyhow, they had their own back on us, because when they did the um, exams, they asked the questions out of all the stuff that we ought to be getting the day that we didn't go, you see. Only the, there were some good people who'd gone, you see, so they were able to answer the question. They got their back on us. very special to be able to hear uh, voices that we wouldn't be able to hear otherwise. Um, 
On the engagement side of things for the Connecting Scotland Science programme, we're trying to get across Scotland as best we can and we're trying to make sure that we are talking to lots of different groups of people. So we've been able to do um, some work with families, we're planning some schools work as well, uh, different communities of interest, different public events. Um, you can see that uh, from the list that there's quite a variety in quite a lot of different parts of Scotland um, and I've got a couple of pictures to show you from uh, events that have already taken place. So that was um, at Elgin Library with Semring Puppets, um, bringing to life some of the recordings of John MacDonald, who was a, a puppeteer, diddler, uh, melodian player, um, and all-round amazing performer. He died um, about 30 years ago, um, and he's from just near Elgin, and uh, we were listening to some of his music and some of his recordings talking about how he you know, um, walked for 14 miles barefoot to see his first circus, to see his first sort of show. Um, and then they got to kind of do their own shows and make their own puppets as well. He was one of um, the few people making puppets at the time in Scotland. And this is um, from an event called Cran of Song, which took place at the Fisheries Museum a few weeks back. Um, in Anstruther and um, we worked with a researcher from the University of St Andrews to, um, she, she did a research project at the Scottish Fisheries Museum on um, fishing music and she curated lots of different songs uh, which were then played throughout the different galleries at the Fisheries Museum and at the end we had some live performances from musicians who um, had looked at some of the archive songs and, and uh, produced their own versions of those songs. Um, so really amazing to have fishing music and these incredible artefacts um, in, in the Fisheries Museum. And I've got a little list at the back on the stall of uh, places that you can listen to sounds online. And two of the uh, places that we got a lot of the recordings from were from Tober and Dolchus and from uh, Ambala. So I'd really recommend if you get a chance, come and pick up a little flyer because it's just wonderful listening to um, some of this material. Okay, so we've got, um, we've been trying to think of ways to talk about sound. Because we're a very visual culture, sound sometimes gets um, uh, a little bit overlooked, but on the radio it's, it's perfect, it's a perfect match for that material. So we've been trying to find radio partners to help us share some of the recordings. And um, if anybody in the audience has links with uh, local radio, please do let me know because we're always looking for new opportunities to make those, those matches. This is hot off the press. Uh, on Thursday we launched a, a researcher in residence programme and we're going to be pairing up to three arts and humanities doctoral researchers who uh, work with SAGSA, which is um, the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities. We're going to be pairing some researchers up with community archives that look after sound collections um, to give those collections a little bit of support and also to provide some funding for um, an engagement event um, after the researcher has been able to curate some of those sounds in partnership with the group. If you do have some sounds and have been thinking about ways to get them looked at a little bit more and to get them shared, um, please do let me know. Again, there's a, um, a form at the back that tells you a bit more. Okay, so um, I mentioned there's sort of at least about 120 different organisations that I know of who've got recorded sounds in Scotland. Um, and there are a number of sound collections um, here in the northeast of Scotland. Um, I'm very lucky to have two colleagues from uh, some of the organisations on the list uh, just here. Here, I might just call up to stand with me just now, if that's all right. So we've got uh, Nick Lebigre, who is from the Elphinstone Institute at the University of Aberdeen, and we've got Jenny Brown from Aberdeen Museums and Art Gallery. Um, I might let Nick kick off to tell us a little bit more about the Elphinstone Institute's archive. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, but just very quickly uh, to tell you that the, the Elphinstone Institute is a centre for research and for public outreach for the north and northeast of Scotland. That's what we focus on. So our, the Elphinstone Institute archives has oral history recordings, traditional music, traditional singing recordings. Uh, 
calendar custom that has all genres that you could possibly imagine, people talking about their lives in the vernacular culture of the northeast of Scotland. Uh, and we're always very happy to have volunteers come, come help us. And there's a, a newsletter over there on the Scotland Sound stand if you're interested in, in learning more about us. And you can always talk to me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, hello again. Um, uh, at Aberdeen Art Gallery Museums, we, we have um, been doing some digital issues over the past few years, but we've also um, inherited the large collection that has been generated over many years by um, people like David Atherton and Arlene Former, which some of you will know. Um, and I just want to say that the, the, the Scotland Sounds Network has been fantastic for us. Amy is helping us to understand. Um, our responsibilities with those collections and how we can preserve and make them available in the future um, for generations to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I think sometimes it's really nice to um, be able to hear from the people who look after those collections themselves. Um, so just to... Yes, there we go. I've got one minute, so I'm going to and play you a tiny bit of a lovely recording from Alphonson, if that's okay. So, sorry, I know I'm not mic'd up, but um, this is a, a Jack tale from a storyteller called Stanley Robertson, who was born into a traveller family. Um, it's a tiny part of the tale, so if you want to have a full tale, you'll have to come and see me. I've got it, um, and if I can put some headphones on you to listen to the full thing. So the lad used to have smoking at this guy, a cleaning, and he was a good enough wee worker. The fellow just never did it before. So when he's finished, he comes to the fellow and he says, Hey man, he says, I've done the job. He says, What do you get to give me? And the fellow says, Well, all I can give you is a saxpence. So he gives him a silver saxpence, and the lad he takes a saxpence, puts it in his hand, and he's delighted. The first money he's ever had in his life. So he walks along this saxpence, and he crosses the burn. But as he gets across the burn, he sees some off a bony wee shining stonies. And he says, I would like to pick up one of the stone, but see if he needs to pick up the stone, he loses his loudie, and he kind of see the saxpence there. So he can help his mother, and he says, Mother, I've got a job. He says, that's fine, Jack. Did you get paid for it? He says, ah, he said, I've got a saxpence. He says, well, pass the saxpence. He says, well, I dropped it in the burn. He says, Jack, Jack, you didn't hear the sense about boring me. The next thing you get something like that, put it into your boots, you know, you're not sick out of you there. So, the next day he goes back to his work, and when he's finished his work, the farmer says, well, I haven't got any money go. He said, but fit all day, he says, I'll give you this big jug of milk. But Jack remember for his mother to help him to do with you. Put it into his boots. So he gets a smell, and he pours a smell. God, please, boots. And he comes here, sock and wait, his mother says, he slushed himself. <laughs> um, you'll have to hear what he does with the cat. Um, so, um, thank you very much for, um, for listening. I'd be delighted to talk to you later. Um, that's my email address. And um, if you're not able to take it down now, um, just let me know and I'll pass it on. Um, Thank you for listening.